if there's just one IGTV or YouTube episode that you watch of this podcast in all of your existence, make it this one. This is all about to drill or not to drill because frankly, I believe that many, many dentists all over the world are drilling caries too much, too often, and this should stop now. Hi guys, I'm Jazz Glanti. I will not keep you or bore you any longer. I want to go straight to the episode with the legend that is Lewis McKenzie. The story behind this episode is that some months ago, I posted on the two main UK dentist Facebook groups, that's the UK Dentist and Four Dentists by Dentists, uh, and I posted some photos of anterior caries. And I got around about, I think, 5,000 dentists in total to actually view it according to the stats I have, uh, and 1,500 or thereabouts engagement, so people actually clicking on uh, several comments, and it split the nation down the middle. Half of you wanted to drill the life out of these lesions, half of you want to slap on some fluoride and review it. So we'll find out what Louis uh, McKenzie wanted to do. So you can see there's anterior lesions, the proximal, there's a crack line there. Uh, a lot of you are itching to get your handpiece out right now while you're watching this. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating topic, really is. So I I'm, I'm really, really happy to have Louis on. Uh, please join us for this full episode on, on to drill or not to drill. Uh, the answer is around about somewhere halfway if you want to skip straight to that. But why would you? There's so much um, useful stuff that L Louis McKenzie shares with us for care detection process uh, and so much more insight and into the complexity of when or when we shouldn't be drilling into teeth. Uh, the protrusive dental pearl I have for you is uh, something that uh, I borrowed from Louis McKenzie and it's on my course, uh, the Reservoir and Bridge Masterclass, which by the way, uh, on the 31st of May is going up to $90 or after the 31st of May. Uh, before 31st of May, if you use the code MAY2020, it'll give you $68 off, so it's $22 only. Uh, I'm doing this a lot for charity because uh, a lot of the money is going to charity and the rest of it's fees, ads that I'm doing basically. It's, it's my way of contributing for lockdown uh, and I've already had some great feedback, people who who said it's perfect for e-learning. People who've messaged me say that it's made RBBs very clear for them. I'm so pleased to hear it. I personally do think after uh, spending weeks uh, on creating this course that it is the best value CPD you'll do the entire lockdown period. So if I'm wrong, I'll give you your money back. That's that's how confident I am. So um, please join me on the RBB Masterclass. The website is rbbmasterclass.com. And the pearl I have for you uh, is that um, sometimes if you're doing an immediate reservoir bridge, I'll just show you a few slides from, from the course itself. Uh, when you're doing an immediate, you're taking a few risks. You're taking a few aesthetic risks and a few technical risks. So what if the lab work doesn't quite come back as you want it and you're gonna be removing a tooth that day and, and placing the bridge there so your lab work needs to be on point so that communication aspect comes in. And the other aspect is the aesthetics. What if the aesthetics are not ideal uh, and then you're going ahead and uh, placing this bridge? Well, to overcome the risk of the aesthetics, i.e. the shade match of the of the bridge pontic not being ideal or the shape or morphology not being ideal for the day that you're gonna fit the immediate reservoir and bridge, you can do a split pontic. So here are some photos that Louis um, gave to me to, as part of my um, online lecture on Res 1 bridges uh, on the split pontic technique. And basically what you, what you do is you request the laboratory to make the framework as normal. And on top of the framework, there has been some composite placed uh, as a core. And then you get a separate pontic, ceramic pontic that actually can uh, bond on to the composite core. And the benefit here is that you can check the fit of the framework and obviously bond that on. And then you can check um, whether you're happy and the patient's happy with the shade and aesthetics of, of, of the Pontic. Because if the, the patient is not happy, then all you need to do is cement the Pontic in with a temporary cement. But if you're happy, you're going to go ahead and follow your adhesive protocol, which we discussed on the course. So the split Pontic technique is really good for immediate reservoir and bridges on patients with high expectations and high smile lines. So that's one of the pearls I'm going to share with you today. So let's jump straight to the episode now with Lewis McKenzie, all about to drill or not to drill caries, when and why. Today is uh, not, I mean, today is not about sexy composites, veneers, aesthetics. This is something that needs to be more on Instagram rather than that sort of stuff because or, or, or on the social media platforms and dentistry. This is a massive, huge daily topic. You're right. It doesn't lend itself to, uh, to Instagram. But for me, it is a sexy subject. That says probably too much about me. Presenter the podcast, it's an absolute honour to have you. Uh, thank you, Jazz, uh, and nice to meet you as well. 
Thanks so much. And I mean, uh, it's your first time sort of you're you know, virtually meeting me, but I've been to quite a few of your lectures. Uh, and, and the reason I thought of you to bring you on on this topic of, of caries management in, in, in primary care, which is such a huge topic, is you really had a massive influence on me in about, I think it was 2011, 2012, BDA conference. You were at the, the main stage, about 400 people. You had this massive wide screen. Uh, and it was not only a very informative educational lecture, it was very funny as well. And I really liked your teaching style. So I, I then came on to future courses as well. But at that lecture, the way you had managed caries was like a paradigm shift for me. It really was. So you'd, you'd always stuck in my mind. And, you know, now and again, I see a bite wing and I, I sometimes think, what would Lewis do? Honestly. <laughs> it's, it's true 100 percent. so when when when, 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 when this podcast uh, came to be i'd already earmarked you as one of the people i really wanted to have on the show to to talk about this so uh, just for the listeners out there who uh the small minority who don't know who you are already just uh, tell us about about you know uh your your daily um life and work and whereabouts you're working at the moment okay um so uh, yeah I've, I've been qualified for 30 years this year I've worked continuously in the same pra practice, um, which I think immediately makes you more minimally invasive anyway, because you mm. see all your, your failures come back to, uh, to, to haunt you. Um, and, uh, you know, the big, big stuff sometimes there's no plan B. Uh, so, yeah, I still consider myself to be a GDP, but that's a small part of what I do now. Um, so my main job is sort of teaching, undergraduate teaching at Birmingham uh, Dental School and uh, postgrad teaching, uh, uh, mainly postgrad courses, sort of private postgrad courses, uh, but also I do um, uh, plenty of uh, uh, plenty of work with young graduates, FDs, um, and uh, my sort of latest uh, latest sort of role. I run the MSc in restorative dentistry uh, at a Birmingham Dental School. That's just uh, in its third year now, so I'm certainly enjoying that. Um, Is that and, with the uh, Trevor Professor Buck? Uh, yep, that's with Trevor. Yep, it's the it's the it's the new course. Trevor's run the has the longest running uh, MSc uh, in advanced general dental practice, uh, and now that has been uh, sort of uh, evolved into an MSc in restorative dentistry, which is a, a two year blended learning program. Also, do a bit down at King's as well in the postgrad department there with the two Banerjee's, uh, Avi Banerjee on the MI Masters and uh, yeah. Sabir Banerjee on the Aesthetics Masters as well. So yeah, a real, uh, a real range of, uh, of things, lots of different bosses to, uh, to keep happy. Brilliant. And um, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Dipesh Palmer, his work, his philosophy. And I believe you were his uh, inspiration, his mentor. I mean, I, I, that's, at least he credits you uh, for that. So that speaks volumes about you as an educator, I think. Well, that's uh, that's kind of that's kind of switched roles now because he <laughs> <laughs> when the student uh, has become the master. Oh, indeed, yeah, proper Jedi. Uh, so, yeah, he's uh, yeah, he's. You must be so proud. Now. You must be really proud. Oh, extremely, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, right, right from the word go. I think over the years, one thing I, I, I think I have become pretty good at is actually spotting talent. Um, and uh, right from right from the word go, there was just something different about Depeche. He just got this natural eye for stuff, um, and um, yeah, it's been an absolute delight to watch him go from strength to strength. Sort of uh, internationally famous uh, famous lecturer, and the, and the stuff that he's doing with composite is just uh, off the scale. Um, uh, and so yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. As uh, as I often say to the under you need to be as good as good as me. Uh, I'm, I'm training you to be much, much better, uh, and they are e e every year. But uh, Depeche is one of the first, uh, a real sort of uh, innovator, and there's, a, the, there's lots of people snapping at his heels, but he's, he's moving fast. He certainly is, but um, today is uh, not, I mean, today is not about sexy composites, veneers, aesthetics. This is something that needs to be more on Instagram rather than that sort of stuff because or, or, or on the social media platforms and dentistry. This is a massive, huge daily topic, uh, daily controversies that we face, caries. And I want to just uh, dive right in and ask you uh, some really pertinent questions uh, about caries. And, and I'm going to start straight away with the following one. So I think most GDPs are not using a caries assessment system. Would you agree with that in your experience to t talking to GDPs in, in the field and, and uh, when you educate about this stuff? And um, what, what is your advice to these GDPs about 
the carry systems out there because it can, it can get very confusing, especially if you haven't been taught that at undergraduate level. Yeah, I think uh, probably most dental schools do teach it, but I don't know how strong the focus is. I know King's with Avi Banerjee, it's, it's literally uh, front, and, front and foremost. Uh, I, I teach those particular subjects at, um, at, at Birmingham. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, certainly from your question, uh, yeah, I, um, I think what you're implying is that the majority of people don't use a caries uh, um, assessment system. Um, and, uh, and many from, uh, unfortunately, people I've also taught uh, don't even know <laughs> that one exists. True. And, uh, this, from my experience of reading people's notes, uh, working in many practices internationally, Singapore here, uh, spe- uh, also working alongside American, US trained Harvard, you name it, uh, dentist in Singapore, I was there and I'll check their, check their notes. No one would mention anything in their diagnoses that would suggest that they were A, aware or B, happy to utilize that system. So this seems to be an international issue and hoping that will change it, if you think it has a place. And that's what I wanted to, to lead this conversation that, you know, have they got a place in, in contemporary dentistry? Uh- I think definitely not not just for, well for a number of reasons. Um, uh, just to sort of uh, recap, I mean the, the the system that's sort of internationally recognised um, is the uh, ICDAS system, uh, Inter- international caries detection uh, and assessment system, originally dreamed up by some cariologists in a dark room. Uh, <laughs> over many <laughs> days um, and so the actual system itself um, is actually it's quite a complicated system but a simplified version of it is something that's really really easily put into into clinical practice uh, because basically uh, caries as we know every single lesion is different um, uh, and uh, it is difficult to uh, detect it's difficult to monitor and um, uh, but having a system which is literally just a, a, a one to six numbering system, it actually makes you think about the disease, um, helps monitor it, and also most, uh, you know, very importantly, from a sort of a dento legal point of view, just literally by writing sort of one digit, um, it demonstrates that you've detected it and you've diagnosed it, um, and you know that it's there. So, uh, so certainly in this sort of uh, increasing the uh, litigious environment, I think the system um, works well. Where can one go to if there's a dentist listening to this and thinking, "Oh, I didn't know systems exist," or you know what, I really should be using a system? Uh, where is the best resource for them to learn? Because I think it's a bit beyond this podcast episode to to, to go through that all. I mean, if you want to do a, a quick summary, if, if that's even possible, possible in an audio format. But where can one go to learn more about that if they want to implement it in their workflow and diagnoses? And um, just just loads of stuff. Uh, out there, don't go to the sort of the uh, the super complicated um, uh, sort of documents, which are sort of multi-page, which are all about sort of epidemiological studies uh, on caries, which is obviously is it, incredibly important to base our caries management uh, protocols on. Um, but the basic system, literally, just click on anything, um, click on Google Images, and you'll find uh, hundreds uh, of sort of. Um, uh, nicely illustrated guides. The basic system uh, is quite simple. Uh, it's sort of zero to six. Zero, basically, you look at the tooth, looks normal. You don't have to write a, uh, write a zero. Um, a code one is one of those lesions that uh, you've got to dry the tooth to see it. You know, when you dry the fissures or you dry a smooth surface and you get that sort of uh, opaque uh, whiteness, that's the earliest visible sign of, uh, of caries. Uh, so that would be a code one. Then a code two is a lesion, um, wherever it might be, which is visible wet or dry. Three is when you start to get a little bit of cavitation. So there's some enamel breakdown as well. Um, so obviously by putting these numbers, you can actually, you can actually record that a carrier's lesion is getting, uh, um, staying the same or, or getting worse. So it's good for monitoring. Four, I think, is quite an important one because those, those uh, lesions that we're quite familiar with, where you've got a lot of shadowing um, under the dentine, no obvious cavity, but you just know that something is cooking underneath there. Um, uh, and then five is a lesion uh, which has got obvious dentine exposure, so a, a cavity. You might need to remove carry, uh, You might need to re- remove some food debris to visualise it. Mm. So that's a five. 
And then six, basically, is just a big lesion that sort of is covering about half of the tooth. Um, uh, so, uh, so over 50% would be a, 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 a um, classic classified as a, a six. Um, and, and so that's a really, really simple, um, a simple system to show that you've detected the lesion, um, and uh, that you're thinking about it. And also from a monitoring point of view, because you know what it's like, if you look at two different, you, you look at the same lesion every six months. You know, if you haven't got photos, um, very difficult with the number of patients we see to actually work out, has it stayed the same? Has it got worse? Uh, but if you've got a number there, you can think, oh, right, yeah, yeah, that was a one last time. It's still a one now. Let's just keep a watchful uh, uh, watchful eye on it. The good thing about caries, of course, is it, it doesn't move fast. <laughs> mm. You know, you're not going to go from, a, you know, an early enamel lesion to in the pulp um, in six months. Um, uh, Chris Deary, the dean of your, uh, of your he, dentist He school. taught me the ICDAS system. So, yeah, uh, shout out to yeah. him, of course. I mean, internationally, um, I, I think I had the same sort of uh, um, experience as you did when I saw him lecture at the BDA conference. Uh, and it, and it, was, it was an absolute revelation. The bloke's a fantastic lecturer uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, and lots of things that I remember from that lecture. But, uh, but one of the things that stood out was I remember he said, um, uh, caries isn't cancer. And, you know, it was a fairly... Can, can you say uh, you that know, again in his accent? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got a Scottish surname, but I can't do the accent. This <laughs> is not the answer. Uh, no, that's, that's too Scottish. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, obviously, he was making, you know, quite, quite a blunt point that, you know, if we miss uh, a leukoplakia that then turns into something nasty, six months later, that patient you know, it may be game over. Uh, you may have an inoperable lesion. Um, so obviously from a soft tissue point of view, we've got to pounce on those uh, and take a, you know, a very, you know, cautious, uh, a very cautious approach. But with caries, uh, because it is moving so slowly, I mean, you're talking about sort of um, three years to get through the uh, enamel uh, in, certain, in certain patient groups, you can adopt a much more watch and wait um, uh, sort of protocol, but as long as you're recording things well from a dental legal point of view, again, what we don't want to do is put a lot of, uh, you know, watch a lot of lesions, not record it well, and patient goes down the uh, down the road to see another dentist, um, and then even though a minimally invasive strategy has been employed, it just hasn't been, um, uh, it just hasn't been documented. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, it's. Um, uh, it's a slow moving disease um, that, uh, you know, do, again, we, we need to keep a watchful eye on it, especially with class two lesions, because some, sometimes those sort of D1 lesions can suddenly take off um, mm -hmm. uh, with no sort of uh, obvious change in the environmental conditions. Patients still brushing the same uh, diets, diets similar. Um, so, yeah, real sort of watch and wait. Uh, but from an occlusal point of view, um, you know, it's so easy to watch the occlusal surfaces and, of yeah. course, to seal lesions as well. Uh, you know, if you're worried, you don't have to drill into it. Um, uh, if you don't think it's one for monitoring, just seal it. Well, you touched on it just there in, in your answer there is that um, if the patient goes down the road, that's one of the big worries I think um, young dentists have in, in monitoring lesions that may be uh, code three, for example, and you can see it radiographically and you sort of, get uh, the, this feeling that if you do not treat it and the, the patient goes down the road, then the, another, another dentist with a uh, different mindset, different you know, pair of goggles would say, whoa, 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 you've, you've got really bad decay. This needs to be uh, treated. So what we, you know, not only does it need to be documented, but I do try and have a very um, explicit uh, conversation with my patients so that they can really remember this conversation I'm about to have with them. So that, I say, you have got decay. And, and I'm sorry to all Americans out there who listen to my podcast, but I say, if we were in America, you'd be having all these fittings done, but you're not, we're in Europe. And that, that, this is my line, and they seem to remember it, right? Uh, so again, very sorry <laughs> to you Americans. I really apologize for that, being in the hot water there. But, but yeah, I, 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 den I generally make a, a point to have a conversation with a patient. And I think that's the only way that we can, we can address this without worrying about the patient going down the road to the other dentist, right? I mean, how, how, how do you uh, tackle that? 
Totally, 100% agree. The patient's got to know where the lesions are. Um, you know, I will give them uh, photos, um, you know, e email the, uh, the photos of them so they know exactly where the lesions are. So when the dentist detects something, uh, when they do go to another practice, yeah, it's not a surprise. Oh yeah, yeah, I've been watching. Uh, I've been watching that lesion there. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm keeping it nice and clean. It hasn't, uh, you know, it hasn't changed. It's been like that. You know, in some cases, for for ten years. Uh, so yeah, there should be no surprises. Patients certainly shouldn't be surprised because it is, you know, it is their disease that they're carrying around. Um, but if it's arrested, nobody would want an operation, uh, you know, anywhere in the body on something. Uh, that didn't need it. Um, uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, a good way of looking at it is if you do drill into a tooth, um, so, say you make a mistake um, uh, and the, the lesion was active, it progresses. Six months down the line, the cavity you actually drill is going to be no bigger than the one that you would have drilled on day one. Very true. Um, so, and then, and once the restoration goes in, um, you know, a patient with a carious lesion is high carious risk by definition. So then you've got, uh, once you've done the restoration, that high carious risk patient, because they're not, not high carious risk until they're proven otherwise, has then got a whole margin of the restoration to look after uh, as well. Um, and so a non-cavitated lesion compared to, a, say, a, a, a class two composite restoration or something like that is much easier to maintain um, than you know, uh, than a than a material that literally from day one is experiencing sort of nano leakage and, and micro leakage. Uh, so uh, yeah, drilling into teeth uh, it, it might feel uh, it, it might feel sort of um, comfortable to do that and a safe thing to do that just in case. You know, from a biological point of view, uh, it's uh, you know you could argue it's it, it's it's not far off butchery uh, to drill into something that doesn't. That, that is arrested and it isn't progressing. Uh, but your, your point about patient knowing exactly what's going on in their mouths is absolutely essential. I, I like the fact that you uh, send the photos. I try and do that where I can as well, the intro camera photos, so that they have a record that this has been discussed. But also, they, I think that motivates them and, and they, they um, really understand what's happening in their own mouths. Um, on, that, uh, on that note, just a side question, how big of an influence does it, happen uh, does it have on your treatment plan if the patient with the same mouth but one is a regular attender and one is, is an irregular attender i mean there's so many factors that contribute to your treatment planning and, and caries uh, but whether their attendance pattern is one of them so i tend to be a little bit more aggressive in my treatment with someone who is irregular attender so if there's um going to be a restoration i'd rather watch it on the regular attender but if someone is they only come in when there's a problem, and I diagnose all these caries, which is borderline. I'm more inclined to treat that person than not. But maybe, uh, maybe that's not the right way to do it. No, no, I totally agree, and I think you know the the evidence base would agree with that as well. If you can't be sure, that, you know, if they're if they're uh, zipping off, and you might not see them for another five years. Classic situation if we've if you've got this sort of um, I don't know so say sort of code two lesion you're just wondering should I seal this or should I drill um, uh, again you know the sealants so if, if if you think they're not going to come back for another five years or something like that then I I uh, along with you be much more likely to just drill into that and just open it up because you can keep it super small um, you know. Uh, just see how far it goes. Whether you know the difference between a you know a conventional filling and a PRR, it's you know it's very difficult to sort of actually define one from the other. Um, but you could just keep it super small, uh, just give put a nice self cleansing restoration in there, and yeah, you've stopped the disease, and then you haven't got to worry about them um, uh, uh, sort of uh, yeah the, 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 them not caring for it mm -hmm. or or getting even worse. And also, you know, if a patient's got a mouth full of them, uh, obviously attack the uh, attack the worst ones first, um, because you know you can be really surprised. Uh, it's things that you think, oh yeah, this is going to be a decent cavity, um, is uh, a tiny. And equally, especially working where I work in in Birmingham, you can be surprised the other way, where you know loads of fluoride in the water, the enamel is you know very strong, very fracture resistant. So you can get some serious uh, sort of uh, occult caries, yep. as, it, uh, as it used to be called, uh, occurring under there. So you can get some massive lesions when you look at the surface and you think they don't look too bad. 
I mean, this is one of the things, you know, you said at the start that, you know, it's not a, <laughs> it's not a sexy subject and it probably, you're right, it doesn't lend itself to, uh, to Instagram. But for me, it is a sexy subject. That says probably too much about me because it is absolutely the core of, of what we're here for. Um, uh, and it's why dentistry exists. Uh, and, it, and it is almost a sort of the importance of it is almost a forgotten subject. Um, or, well, obviously not forgotten, but um, uh, it is a subject that probably does. It's, it's never <laughs> you're never going to have much uh, m many uh, Instagram followers uh, with pictures of carious lesions. But well, we're hoping to change that. We're hoping to change that, and the way we're going to change I'd it now. Sign up. Uh, <laughs> well, the way we're going to change it now is that now that we're talking about a uh, what we mean you agree is a sexy subject. Let's pull out some photos. Uh, <laughs> now, why, don't, why don't you share the the, the PowerPoint and we can discuss uh, the, the case. Uh, and I'll give everyone a background while you're sharing the screen. So this is a 54-year-old male patient of mine who uh, attended for an examination with me, has been to the practice uh, for over eight years. Uh, and one of the great things about the practice that I work in is that... Just yeah, perfectly. Uh, we do plaque scores and bleeding scores um, for every hygiene visit. And this is someone who's got quite uh, impeccable oral hygiene, regular attender. Uh, and first time I, I was seeing him and um, that's what I found. I was like, whoa, okay. And I had a look at the chart and nothing was um, documented. For those of you who are driving right now and listening or chopping their onions and they, haven't, they can't, they can't uh, see the photos, I, I'd urge you to check this out on YouTube to check out um, I'll, you know, have a, however many minutes this is into podcast to to see the photos because this is a clinical scenario that you may encounter or may have encountered many times. So um, this is, like I said, fifty four year old male, regular attender, uh, and I really struggled internally to decide whether I pick up the handpiece or not. And I almost treatment planned him to come back to to start uh, start some treatment, but I remembered we'd agreed to have this podcast episode. Uh, and like you said, Kerry is not cancer, so I was totally comfortable to, to to send him with some fluoride and say, "Look, no, I'm speaking with someone who, in my opinion, is a um, very experienced and knowledgeable, far more than I am. Let me speak to him, and, and I'll tell you what he says." So I'll be reporting back to the patient after this. But in this scenario, let's start with the ICDAS. Can you uh, tell the ICDAS just from the photos and radiograph, or do you need some clinical input as well? No, I mean, they're clearly fours, aren't they? So, you know, we've got shadowing, we've got no obvious cavities, but we've got shadowing under the uh, under the enamel there. Um, obviously, we've got some cracks as well. You know, it's, it's an interesting case that you've uh, you've chosen there. Uh, great photos as well, by the way. Um, Thank you. Uh, and and I, oh, I forgot to mention, actually, for background information, this post uh, had around about... 5,000 UK dentists look at it and 1,600 engagements. So what that means is that someone's actually clicked on and actually read more about it and flicked through yeah. and 169 comments. Um, and they were literally split in half. Uh, and some of their responses were, oh yeah, who, yeah, who would have thought dentists say? Eh? Uh, and some of the responses were not only very polarized, but some were really passionate. I mean, to some people, you are extremely negligent if you if you monitor this to so others they 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 propose the the daughter test or the mother test and they say you know i wouldn't have this on my daughter i'd, I'd watch it mm -hmm. so you had really you know a uh, real polar response and uh, the, reading these comments has has been quite entertaining for me um and and and, and uh, one thing that i could just ask you straight off the bat that is was i right to take a radiograph because some, someone said that actually why do you take a radiograph you can tell us carries there does that does that really show anything and i think yeah respect but uh, for me, to help me decide whether, whether I want to drill or not, the radiograph for me was important. So what do you think about the radiograph adding benefit? Does it or did I not? should I not have? In this, in this situation, well, certainly from a dental legal point of view, you're definitely justified. So that's, that's the first thing to, uh, to say. Um, um, so there's no question about it from a dental legal point of view. But equally, obviously, any radiographic um, uh, investigation should uh, improve the quality of your diagnosis or improve the outcome to the patient's uh, patient's treatment but now we're we're all looking at this lesion there and we've got the radiograph and we're probably none the wiser <laughs> that's true <laughs> because of course unfortunately early lesions 
do show up terribly on x-rays and particularly particularly with anterior views uh, as uh, as well so i think there's a there's a good argument uh, there's a good argument uh, both ways um, uh, there um so um so many would say yeah it, 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 it's uh, it's not justified because it's not going to give us any more information but of course until you've got the radiograph you you don't actually know that it's not. Yeah, I, I was kind of hoping that it, it'd be really clear cut for me, and then like, okay, I definitely need to intervene now. But uh, no, you're, you're right. We're none the wiser. So, <clears throat> what would Lewis do? <laughs> well, I'm delighted. To is there say. is there any more information that you want? I mean, I can I can give you the, any information. Um, I think the key to this one uh, would be. I mean, we could use transillumination. That's probably going to make it look even more horrible. Um, and probably going to push you towards um, uh, uh, towards restoring it. Uh, I think really the only way you can be certain is to put a tooth separator in. So orthodontic separator. Now, obviously, they're a bit uncomfortable, um, and leave that in uh, sort of, uh, you know, I mean, you can leave it in for a few days, but after a couple of days, you're going to get tooth separation, um, and so then you can basically take the separator out um, and um, you can actually see, is the surface cavitated? If the surface is cavitated, then the decision is made for you. A cavitated lesion cannot arrest. Um, the biofilm can't be removed, even if this patient becomes an Olympic standard flosser, uh, there's no way that the lesion can not progress, albeit very, very slowly. Uh, so if there's a cavity, the, the, the job's kind of done for us. So can I tell um, you what I did? Yeah. I placed a wedge. Yep. And I was able to just about feel my probe to confirm there wasn't a cavity, but that crack that you see uh, on upper right one distal yep. and upper right, right two, I can just feel the sort of um, feel the sort of the, the the crack almost. That's what I was feeling my probe just gently, no cavitation. Yep. So to me, that was what that's it was the crack that was swaying me towards treating because. The crack is in you know in some ways it, it it is a cavitation in a way. Yeah, absolutely. It's a way for bacteria in there. Uh, we know there are bacteria in there. You know, millions of them, uh, in fact. Um, uh, uh, and the, the crack really is is a tricky one um, because uh, now the crack has probably been caused by the lesion. Um, the demineralized enamel, from a mechanical point of view. Uh, is weaker. This patient's in his fifties. He's, he's been biting and uh, and protruding uh, on these teeth, so it's it's cracked because it's unsupported by the um, demineralized uh, dentine uh, underneath. But obviously, that crack is not an actual cavity. Uh, it's a way for bacteria in, but you know they've really got to queue up to get into that, <laughs> into that, uh, <laughs> into that lesion. Um, so it, I mean, it's a very good case that you've chosen because it is a very difficult. There is no um, uh, if you if you separate the teeth and there is no cavity. Obviously, the crack's still there. Um, you know, you can see that. Um, yeah. Also, from a uh, from a class two point of view. Um, you often see these cracks, early carious lesions, um, been there for a while, uh, and then you can get a crack right from the centre of the marginal ridge all the way down into the lesion. You'll see these quite often when you extract a tooth and there's been a, there's been a, car a carious lesion on the adjacent tooth. You'll see these vertical cracks going right down to the lesion there. Um, so, you know, it's a really, really tricky one uh, to uh, um, because if we drill into that, we go from a crack to a massive hole in the tooth, which is then going to have to be replaced. Patient's in his 50s, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure your composites are amazing. So, but again, um, uh, 10 years down the line, great. 20 years down the line, fantastic. Let's get the balloons out. Um, but uh, the, the likelihood is that that restoration isn't going to last forever. Uh, and then when it's taken out, as we all know, the cavity is going to get bigger. Um, and of course, the average composite doesn't last that long. Um, so, you know, six to seven years. Um, class three is difficult to do as well. Um, yep. You know, regardless of rubber dam or not, uh, 
difficult restorations to get a perfect finish. Uh, so then we've got excess composite beyond the margins, probably. Um, uh, we've got microleakage, nanoleakage. Uh, we've got um, polymerization shrinkage stress. We've got expansion and contraction of the material, which is going to be different to the um, uh, different to the tooth tissue itself. So are we actually creating a worse environment than the environment that was there before? Um, so yeah, it's it's a tricky one. Now, obviously, we all know some of our colleagues. We wouldn't be having this argument. The only argument would be which which porcelain are you going to use for the crown on these? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, oh, USA. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, guys. I'm just kidding. I don't, well, then I don't, I don't know if I'm kidding or not. But okay, let's just. <laughs> that's a different debate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so yeah, it is a really tricky one. I think. Re, uh, the, I mean, the nice thing is, you know, you know your patient well. You're seeing them regularly. Um, and uh, the other thing in this particular situation, it's dead easy to remove the biofilm. Carious lesions are driven from the surface. If you can remove the biofilm, kind of doesn't matter what it looks like, because if that does progress, it's going to be so glacial that the patient is going to be 200 years old uh, <laughs> before uh, <laughs> uh, before you've got anything to worry about um, uh, at all. So I certainly think in this particular case, uh, I would uh, adopt uh, a watch and wait um, policy if you're, you're making me uh, make a decision. And to be honest, we've got all the information that we would have. I mean, you've got great photos, uh, you've got a radiograph as well. There, we're going to get no. We're going to get no more information if we had the patient actually in the chair, other than other than the tooth separation. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so for me, the patient can look after this lesion, and you can review it regularly. And see what happens. Uh, give it the, uh, the the dairy test. The the dairy test. It, uh, brilliant. I love it. See how it goes. If it, it you know, and if it moves, you have got great pictures there. Um, and um, and so um, so let's talk about something that would change my management in this case. So if it was an irregular tender uh, and the surfaces were covered in plaque and yeah. the, the ble oh, bleeding okay maybe the, the plaque scores were consistently in their you know 30s and 40s uh, and maybe you know the quality of saliva wasn't so good then my uh, protocol here or decision making here would not only be to pick up the handpiece but i'd actually treat them all even because because the patient's going to have an anesthetic procedure uh, rubber dam and that moment i just get even the smaller ones i just restore them it that's it for me it's all or nothing and now it is my all or nothing approach justifiable in that sense? If I'm gonna do, if I'm gonna drill one, I'm gonna drill them all. And I sometimes do that. I, I, not. Keep, I keep an open mind. Keep, keep an open mind. Do the. Um, uh, I, I think it's. In, uh, I think in dentistry we should always have the, uh, you know that flexibility to just keep all of our options open. I mean, the nice thing about sort of lesions sort of opposite each other is treat the worst. You know, so you did decide for whatever reason to drill into it or do a test drill or whatever. Um, uh, then um, the nice thing is once you've done that, you can actually look directly at the adjacent tooth. Quite often you will see, especially on posterior uh, class twos all the time, um, you prep one, you will always see some demineralization um, of the opposing teeth. Um, just because they've been living opposite a carious lesion for, for ages. So it's demineralized no cavity at all and as soon as you put the restoration in that tooth's going to fix itself teeth are very very good at repairing themselves uh, you know we uh, you know we know that the odontoblasts are working day and night uh, <laughs> against carious uh, carious lesions if, if if we can give teeth a chance to actually remove the environmental factors then they're going to uh, then they're going to fix themselves so so yeah if you uh, sort of prep one and then just have a really good look with magnification, uh, ideally at the adjacent Absolutely. tooth. You can actually feel the surface carefully with a probe. Obviously, you know, not probing into the lesion, but coming across the lesion, you can see if that surface is broken. Um, and then if not, again, take a nice photo of that. Um, you let the patient know we've got this lesion here. You know, you, used, you, uh, you, you mentioned the daughter test, which I think is an excellent benchmark for any operative procedure. Uh, you know, 
would you, would you drill into it on your daughter? And if you wouldn't, leave it alone um, because uh, you're only going to make a massive hole and fill it with something um, uh, where, where really you've just got to, you know, uh, either no defect or a little crack. Brilliant. So now we know what Lewis would do and I feel I can sleep well tonight knowing I did exactly that. <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll email the patient as well and say, look, yeah, it, it was split opinion, but here's uh, here's what we think. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer, you know, because this one is a bit borderline. You know, it, it, if it was way less um, in terms of size of these lesions, then maybe maybe we'll be having a different conversation. But I, I picked a borderline one on purpose, obviously. So for those of you on the on the pages on Facebook who who said that I would definitely treat it, you know, don't, don't, I, I wouldn't be, you know, too hard on yourself, whatever, because. Yeah, there's no right or wrong answer. Yeah, yeah. Of course, if you drill into that lesion, again, you'd say, oh yeah, I did the right thing, there's caries there. Uh, yes. Because you just, you justified not, yourself, yeah. It's not the same, but unfortunately, you drill into almost any fissure in the mouth, <laughs> you, you, you will find the process of demineralization knocking around. Um, you could argue that every human has got the caries process going on all the time. Uh, the world's most common, uh, most common disease, uh, but it's only if it's progressing that, that it's an issue. But yeah, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great case that you've uh, that you've, you've chosen there because uh, I mean, I, you mentioned about it being fifty-fifty. I remember a good quote from one of my friends, um, uh, Professor Giles Perrier, uh, who said that uh, there's only. Uh, um, there's only one thing that two dentists will agree on, uh, and that is that a third dentist is wrong. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're you know that's one thing nice thing about it. There, there isn't a unified theory of dentistry, and you know that's what I like about it that it is a subject whether it's sexy or not that it is easy to discuss one lesion for what ten minutes, <laughs> fifteen minutes, like we just had. It certainly is. So we'll, we'll ask you to, Lewis, is just um, uh, switch off the screen share now. If that's okay. Incidentally, what's cooking on? What's cooking on the um, on the uh, towards the uh, the apices of those um, uh, of those incisors? Um, you know, I hadn't even looked there before. <laughs> See, uh, yeah, so it looks like a canine, but it can't be, surely not, because uh, this person has their canines. But yeah, there is an opacity there, isn't there, on the above the upper left one. It's another one for you to investigate next time. Another podcast coming up. Just, oh, that's it. Part two. Part two. You just, you just wanted a part two. But no. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for laying those yeah. images out so, so neatly there. So um, you've answered actually a lot of the other questions that I was going to get into. So the final question I want to ask is, many dentists believe that a radiographic lesion that's uh, inter interdentine is automatically pick up the handpiece. What message do you want to send to these dentists? Oh, that's, that, again, it's a good one, and I, I don't know whether I'm actually changing my personal opinion um, on the, on this subject. Um, so just just to, sort of sort uh, of to refresh, we, we've got the uh, the ICDAS system, um, which is uh, the proper ICDAS system is actually a two digit system, uh, and the, and the first digit describes whether it's a a, a tooth surface or it's a it's the margin of a restoration or margin of a sealant um so it's actually a two-digit system uh, so but the, just the basic icdas system is um uh is uh that you could just it's just simple one digit a different system not to be confused with the icdas system is the radiographic grading of the carious lesions um, because the radiographic appearance is, is something very different. The radiographic appearance we know is, you know, on average six months behind what's actually going on uh, inside uh, inside the tooth from a histological point of view. Um, so the, 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 the recognised system is sort of the uh, a system that basically is a two-digit system. Uh, so two two uh, so basically an, an E1 lesion. So if you're looking at a bite wing, and you've got a lesion that's um, Less than halfway through the enamel, uh, you know the, uh, uh, the radiolucency, then that's an E1 lesion. When the lesion then uh, extends uh, beyond the centre of the enamel, wherever it might be, then that's an E2 lesion, but it's still short of the dentine. No obvious dentine changes. Then a D1 lesion is one of those lesions where you see some radiolucency in the outer third of the dentine. 
uh, uh, sorry, did I say E? I meant D. Uh, so a, D, a D1 lesion D, yeah. is the outer third of denting. Uh, a D2 lesion is where you've got uh, radiolucency in the middle third of denting. And then a D3 lesion is when you've got deep um, uh, deep caries, sort of inner third of dentine, uh, you know, even if you've got sort of pulpal exposure. The, the system doesn't really go beyond uh, D, uh, D3. Um, so it's a useful system, again, for assessment. As, as Professor Banerjee, I'm quoting all the legends today, um, mm -hmm. Professor Banerjee or Professor Kidd, um, that, uh, you know, a single radiograph in time, you could argue, is, you know, it's important information, but it's actually meaningless when it comes to caries activity. The only way you can show from a radiograph that a lesion is active is if you've got two radiographs taken a minimum of six months apart. If the lesions got worse, then that's by definition an active lesion. So that's going to be sway you more towards uh, operative management. Um, but equally, if you've got a series of radiographs showing uh, a lesion, even if it is a D1 lesion and it's not changing, um, then um, you know, you can basically say from all the evidence that you've got, and especially from a dental legal point of view, that that is an arrested lesion. The only thing that... Uh, and again, this is quite sort of anecdotal. And I, I, I did do a lecture once, uh, talk, talk about, uh, uh, I did a lecture not just on, on one tooth. I did a lecture on one surface, an hour lecture on one surface of one tooth. Uh, and, this, uh, and this exact scenario had happened. And it was a lesion that I'd followed. Um, it was a D1 lesion for, um, uh, for uh, I think it was six years. No change at all. Bite wings looked exactly exactly the same. It was one of those lesions where you look at it and you think, day one, drill. Now, this patient had a number of these lesions, a lot of them, about 20 of them. So the, the deeper ones uh, were, were treated. Um, but then I adopted a sort of watch and wait um, policy and was really surprised that because the patient completely transformed his diet um, and oral hygiene lifestyle, um, that the lesions just stopped. Um, now, he was one of the, not dissimilar to your patient that you just showed us, uh, where the lesions, they're not, they're not just interproximal. You can see the old demineralization coming round onto the buccal surfaces uh, and the uh, palatal surfaces. Uh, and so these lesions do, you know, can be quite deceiving when you look at them radiographically. But anyway, so I, I watched this lesion quite comfortably uh, for six years. And then six years, after six years, the patient just came in for a checkup and I noticed that the marginal ridge had actually fractured. Uh, occlusal load, so it had actually fractured. Um, uh, and it was still there, uh, but uh, but now the lesion had, uh, lesion had progressed. So it's, it's one of those tricky ones with the, with these, the demineralization, um, are they sort of slowly, slowly, slowly uh, weakening um, the tooth so that under occlusal loads, one day the marginal ridge might give up and the, and the lesion might progress? I mean, the nice thing is, after six years, the cavity was no, no bigger than it would have been if I'd steamed in on day one. Um, but, um, uh, but again, it comes back to your point that that patient was a regular attender, really well motivated, and this is the patient that would have got 20 MODs. If if you know uh, if if we'd taken a uh, a, a, a transatlantic view, possibly, uh, <laughs> oh, 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 I'm not telling you which direction, but uh, uh, so um, uh, so uh, so yeah, it's it's easy to drill into a tooth, but once it's done, it's done forever, um, and you know you, you can't uh, you can't put the cork back in the bottle. Uh, once a tooth's been drilled, a restorative patient is a restorative patient forever. That old uh, that old saying. So, but uh, but equally, I think you know, are these dis uh, these uh, D one lesions just slowly creeping, creeping, creeping? They were, they were separated the teeth on multiple occasions. There was no cavitation of the uh, uh, of the. Uh, Lewis, the you're, you're the first person I ever saw who who's ever taken a um, light body PVS impression of the interproximal surfaces between molars. Yeah, yeah, you don't get many shadows. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know that is uh, that is uh, in uh, you know that is sort of a proper level OCD. <laughs> it was actually it was actually my uh, 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 Prof Perrier I mentioned uh, uh, I mentioned before. I shared an office with him for ten years, 
a real innovator, one of the, uh, the world's leading experts on uh, blended learning uh, in, uh, in, in dentistry. And yeah, so he, he showed me, he showed me that trick. Uh, that wasn't, um, uh, but really you've got to separate the teeth to do that. Uh, as uh, ideally, unless it's an obvious cavity, then it will show up. Uh, but if you separate the teeth, then you can just squeeze the impression material in there. Of course, you've got other ways of doing the uh, look, you know, from a radiographic point of view, uh, these uh, various different scanning, um, uh, scanning procedures uh, that you can use in between the teeth uh, uh, as well. But I think the this when it's if it's an enamel lesion, yeah, and it's non-cavitated. Uh, on the surface yeah again surely none of us would ever want that done in our own to our own teeth uh, but i think when it's when it's getting into the dentine i think we've definitely got to get away uh, from that sort of that trigger response that dentine carries equals drill um, because that that's just not sophisticated enough for uh, you know, for the for the modern uh, for the modern clinician um, and Lewis, do you watch um, do you watch D two lesions as well uh, in the right patient, um, like radiographically, or is that uh, I mean uh, that's such an open question because there's so many variables, I suppose. But yeah, if, if it's a cavity uh, on the surface, again, the the you know separate the teeth, uh, ortho separate. Uh, if it's a cavity, the decision's made for you. Uh, but a non-cavitated D2, occasionally, you, you know, you, you find one. Um, you, do, you do see them. Uh, and again, you know, that is real, <laughs> uh, you know, that is really pushing the boundary. Uh, you know, many people would call that, you know, abject negligence, um, supervised neglect, whatever you, whatever you like to call it. Um, but the textbooks would, would would tell us that the lesion is driven from the surface, from the biofilm, and you know, and if the patient is cleaning that surface, that even a D two lesion. Um, uh, so yeah, that that that's that's uh, that's a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, most D two lesions, in my experience, um, you know, when you actually drill into the marginal ridge to begin with, you make your access cavity. You see straight away from the inside that there's a, that you know there's a cavity there. And so it's the right, you know, you've made the, you've made the right decision. Um, yep. um, uh, again, tunnel preps, um, uh, they, they kind of went out of fashion. Uh, so you, are they, are they you, back you, in you, fashion now? Um, well, they went out of fashion originally because they were, glass ornament was used to do the restoration. Uh, and glass ornament is not strong enough uh, to support the marginal ridge over time. So you tend to find, you know, they worked, they stopped the lesion, but then what happened is that the, the marginal ridges on average tend to fracture because the glass arm was a bit too bouncy uh, under, uh, underneath. But now, of course, you've got bulk fill composite materials that we can inject into these cavities uh, and really quite radio opaque materials as well. Always tricky, uh, you know, even with magnification, to be certain that you've removed all of the caries from a tunnel prep. Uh, but I've done a, I've done a few... Um, uh, uh, in fairly uh, in fairly recent years, because the nice thing is there uh, is you preserve the marginal ridge um, uh, and you sort of attack the lesion sort of directly. Uh, but uh, tunnel prep's tricky sort of thing, especially without magnification. Um, uh, you know, obviously you've got a scope, fantastic. Uh, you know, mm. uh, 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 go for it. But bulk film materials is just so good now that you know you can just inject their nice thin cannula, very radio opaque, low polymerization, shrinkage stress. Um, obviously, you put a matrix band in anyway, so you should get a really good uh, contour because you're literally filling up from the inside. Um, uh, 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 and you're not involving the proximal surface at all because you've got the marginal ridge guiding the matrix that should get a quite a close adaptivity yep. uh, in, that, yep. in that scenario. Wedgie, um, uh, and you can optimize your wedge. You've got a good tip from you mentioned Jason Smithson. Uh, mm -hmm. Good tip from him. You know, if you're not getting a great wedge with your matrix band, uh, just modify that with some PTFE tape, either round the wedge or stuff it in on top of the wedge. Um, or a little bit of flowable composite outside the matrix as well to just optimize your uh, your seal. Uh, yeah, restorative dentistry. You know, got lots of lots of tricks, uh, lots of tricks to fill really quite sort of try, quite tricky cavity shapes. Ca cavities are something that uh, you know, like I said on social media, you see all these smile makeovers. I tend to post quite a few um, restorations, just faster restorations. I think class two is a real art. Um, to get the correct matricing, the correct wedging, the correct gingival removal in some <clears throat> some cases to actually allow the correct emergence profile of your uh, matrix. So 
I, I, it's an aspect of dentistry I enjoy a lot. I, I enjoy a lot, and I think it takes a lot of care and attention to do correctly, uh, and and it, and it can't be rushed. These things. Um, the, 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 that's just a point I made. But the question I want to finish on, uh, Lewis, if you don't mind, is yeah, a do restoration on a five, for example, comps it, and you just see like a discolored margin all around. And dentists are drilling this out, and I've seen it a lot, yeah. saying, "Oh yeah, you got you got leakage. You need you need any restoration." Is that just the biggest baloney ever? Is is that a Robin Hood <laughs> dentistry? Uh, it, it is. Uh, um, uh, we, again, I think Edwina Kidd um, published uh, Professor Kidd at Kings uh, Guys uh, Kings down in uh, down in London. Um, you know, published a lot of the work on this uh, and just showed that we we'll, we remove way too many restorations. Um, uh, and that most of them are functionally absolutely fine. The correlation between marginal stain and secondary caries is almost zero. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, and I'm glad that you made this point to end with because we've mainly been talking about primary caries lesions, which are difficult enough. But when you add secondary caries into the mix, you know, you take a, like you say, you've got a stain around the margin, you take a radiograph. Uh, there's a radiolucency, uh, cervically. What is it? Is it caries? Is it some sort of lining? Is it bonding resin? Uh, is it polymerization shrinkage? Is it a void? Uh, so incredibly difficult. Uh, but we do take out way too many fillings. That's been proved uh, beyond doubt. Um, a, a, a good, a good uh, I'm coming out with all the old quotes, uh, is that, you know, um, Composites can look, you know, uh, uh, can look better than they are. Uh, an amalgam um, looks can look worse than it actually is. Um, so, you know, these materials can uh, can sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, caries will move more slowly under an amalgam restoration. That's for sure because the breakdown products of the corrosion, um, uh, you know, bacteria just don't like those. Um, but uh, but it is tricky. Caries uh, uh, um, uh, around uh, well, stain around composite restoration is a super tricky one to do. Uh, obviously, if it's aesthetics, that tips the balance um, in favour of maybe localised repair or maybe even restoration uh, replacement. Um, but uh, but yeah, if we replaced every single composite with a stain margin, we would never ever do have time to do anything else. Um, because you know the, the materials do develop positive and negative edges over time. Even the best restoration, um, you know, it is going to show up some marginal stain with time. Um, and and obviously, when that restoration is removed, that cavity is getting bigger. So if we can adopt a, a more conservative approach to restoration replacement, and let's face it, more than fifty percent of everything that you, me, every GDP listening to this around the world does involves the replacement of existing restorations, um, not the management of primary disease. But the more restorations we put in, the more problems we create for ourselves, um, actually diagnosing, have they failed or not? The, um, again, the, the diagnosis of restoration failure is a complete science, uh, a separate science and classification system all on its own. Very, very tw- tricky uh, and just so subjective. Um, uh, 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 you know, from clinician to clinician, depending on, you know, their, their clinical experience, the material that's been used, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what they were taught. It's easy Brilliant. to replace a restoration, but, you know, uh, to, to, think, to think about it, does it actually need to be replaced? You know, I think, you know, that, that's why it's five years at dental school, because uh, it actually makes us think about these things. Rather than just if it was just knee jerk stain equals replace, then anybody could do it. Absolutely, it's just a point I made because I, I, you know, it's it's something that happens still, uh, and you really have to sort of challenge that. I think, um, and it's been great having you uh, on the show today. You've given some great uh, what the, what the kids are calling knowledge bombs nowadays. So you've really shared. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I know. Um, so, so that's great. So thanks so much, Lewis, for, for coming on and, and, and talking about a really important topic. Uh, and um, mentioning some great legends in karyology and operative dentistry, and uh, it's it's been a, it's been a great uh, chatting to you. Been a pleasure to chat to you, Jazz. Thank you very much. And, uh, th- thanks for everyone who's listened. 
thank you so much for, for watching all the way to the end. Uh, please do support the rbbmasterclass.com course. I'd, I'd really appreciate to have you on. Uh, subscribe on the YouTube or the IGTV if you're watching on either of those platforms. Or if you're listening, you might want to go back and check the video part to, to see what the lesions look like that we're talking about. Anyway, catch you in the next episode. Thanks again. Thank you so much for listening.